Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. My name is Lars. I run a tiny little data engineering startup named Skling, and I will tell you in a few slides what we're up to. T today's topic is data quality from an, from an engineering, from a data engineering perspective. I had this conversation a while ago. Somebody was complaining that the data pipeline feeding some, some dashboards and, and analytics was down, and he, he was right, it was down. Uh, but we also knew that the data was, was like, had really, really low quality and should not be used for anything whatsoever. But at, at, in this conversation, I realized that that didn't matter to the people downstream. They were you know, like happy to show just about any graph, which baffled me a bit. Uh, because you don't really know whether you have positive, negative value from that, those graphs or not. So uh, we're going to zoom in on data quality today. First, I'll describe the context of it. Uh, and the context is so-called big data environments. I'll, I'll explain what I mean in a minute. Uh, and we'll look at what, where does good data come from, or where does bad data come from, and why do we get one or the other, uh, and, and how we assess whether we have good or bad data, and, and how we perhaps are able to make our data better. Uh, big data is now a sort of waning buzzword. Uh, and it sort of has faded and, and been replaced by AI before even the majority of companies even realized uh, how to get value from big data and, and what the actual real value is. This is my former manager, Adam Kinney. He's been at uh, Twitter, Google, and a bunch of places. And uh, he points out that the value of big data is not machine learning and, and the masses of data that we think are, are uh, that we see in the media and see focus on. But the real value of big data is that it's a different way to collaborate. And y when you, when you uh, sort of adopt the, the practices, you go from a, the typical point-to-point -point integrations between systems, where if you have an idea that requires data from five systems, you have a very long journey ahead of you. And instead, you share the data in, in, uh, in common places. Uh, this was enabled by Hadoop, hence, hence the elephant, which uh, didn't actually uh, have any significant technical contribution, more of an economic contribution. It, after Hadoop, it became economically feasible to, to store all the details of the data and, and share it. And uh, later on, Kafka provided the same kind of feature for or tra transformation for real-time processing data. So what typically happens if you, if you go to these kind of environments is that the first time you have an idea where you want to combine multiple sources of data, you say, OK, but instead of setting up RPC integrations and so forth, how about we, we together dump your data into the data lake? Um, and then we work on the data from there. And the way to work on data is called data pipelines, illustrated by the line at the bottom. This doesn't necessarily help the first time, but over time, as more and more data goes into the lake and into the stream storage, the friction to use data lowers. And that's, th that's sort of the real value. The gr red and green arrows uh, here, you might recognize the symbolics from, from Niklas Munich's uh, keynote the other day. These are meant to be uh, value stream mappings. I apologize for, for any colorblind people out there. And this is what we do at Gling. We do this as a service for uh, the companies that are not super highly technical, for those that are not the, the Spotify's and the Netflix and, and the Ubers out there. Uh, we do this as an external service instead to enable also companies that are not super technical to get the speed of innovation, the time to market in data-driven products and the operational efficiency. And we have a very simple marketing strategy it's me standing here, not talking about us, but sharing the, the knowledge that, that we picked up during the years. So given this little tiny bit of marketing, I will now spend the rest of the time sharing the knowledge. I hope you find that a fair deal. If we zoom in a bit uh, on one of these data platforms, uh, you typically have your uh, online systems out there, and they produce events, and you have, have data stored in databases. You collect the events to, to your, your stream storage or your data lake or both. Uh, and if you have the source of truth in databases, you dump the databases on, on a regular basis so that you have a, like a history back in time. There are a couple of things that I'd like to highlight here. One is that the work happens in pipeline. You transform data in, in multiple steps. 
And then there's an important tool that keeps these pipelines together. The pipelines are, are often not linear, but a mesh of, of like uh, dependent jobs and dependent data sets. And that tool is called the Workflow Orchestrator. Uh, the screenshot that you see here is a tool called Luigi from Spotify. There is also another one that's good. It's called, uh, called Airflow for Airbnb. Then, then there are several that are uh, several of them that are not so good. Uh, and this tool is the data equivalent of a software build tool. So it knows the dependencies between all things, and it knows the commands to build one data set from another, and so forth. And it, it sort of holds the thing together. And we'll, we'll, uh, I'll mention this workflow orchestrator on a number of slides later. Looking at quality, there are four different dimensions of data quality that matter. The timeliness is the data result that we want produced on time? Is it here when I need it at, at 8 a.m. in the morning or, or whenever it is? And did we do the calculations in the pipeline correctly? Given the input data, is the output data correct? And do we have all of the necessary data? Do we have completeness of data? So if we are doing financial reporting of all the things that happen during a month, do we actually have all the data that affects that month? And then consistency, do we, if we compare different pieces of data, do they refer to the same amount of data? Do they, same have, the le do they have the same notion of completeness, or are we comparing apples and oranges? And we'll, uh, I won't go through them really in order, but I will go through various aspects of how we measure and, and uh, assess these, these properties. First, where does good data from, come from? Well, the world has facts, and, and all of the facts are sort of true. This is a colleague of mine said this many years ago. I, I, I really like working, working with data because data is true. Like everything else is like opinions and, and experience, but, but there is actually some kind of truth in data. Except that this, it, it can be, they can be biased, things can go wrong, but somewhere da deep down there is some truth. Now, if you do active experiments, you can change the truth and get worse quality data. Uh, this is an example from Spotify where they had this feature and they A-B tested it. They A-B test everything at Spotify. Uh, there's a rule of thumb that, that uh, about 10% of your ideas are actually good uh, and a substantial percentage of them are harmful, so you really need to measure which ideas are good or not. This one was a, a, a very good idea because the, if you measure the test group versus the control group, the test group performed much better for on some metric. You know, how long are you play for how long are you using the client or something? And af after a while, they discovered that they had accidentally disabled ads for this test group. So uh, all of the users were much happier now, right? but it didn't s really say anything about the feature. The feature in the end turned out uh, not to be valuable, so they discarded it. You can also collect some of the truth, which, which will make your data biased. This is an example from, from uh, uh, some colleagues at RISE, Research, Research Institute of Sweden. They were working with a steel manufacturer, and there are cracks sometimes in the steel leading to corrosion. Uh, so they took the defect reports and see if they could find any predictive values to help them address the issues. It turned out that the, there's one really strong indicator, which was the ID of the customer. So it turns out that some customers really care about these cracks, some don't. And some customers put the steel in corrosive environment where you later see the cr cracks, whereas if you put them indoors, you never see the cracks. So by collect they only had defect reports from some of the customers, uh, and, and that then hence the data was biased. Or you can inject new things that aren't really the truth. Um, this is, this is an example that, I, uh, I was, uh, that occurred one day, one morning. I was, we were standing at the stand-up, and we had these monitoring graphs on the wall, and there was this spike of invalid records. Right? Uh, and the records were supposed to be you know, text, audio, video, podcast, uh, whatever, and reasonable things. But we measured whenever things were not reasonable. And when we debugged things, we, uh, we realized we had this media, new media type called bullshit in the... In the uh, records, and it turned out that somebody upstream uh, doing something 
reasonable had accidentally put a, a test piece of test code into production, which, which then logged this bullshit. And I, and I, I have to uh, compliment him for choosing the name bullshit because downstream it became very obvious that this was just a, just a test. The, uh, the PO of this team, he, he like shook his head and he, he said, we're the sewer of the company. We're the only ones that care about quality data since we're working with financial reporting. Everything garbage upstream like ends here. Uh, you can also have uh, data that is changed or mutated uh, on the way from where it's generated to where you collect it. And, in, and uh, that's, that can be acceptable if you know it. If you don't know it, you might fall into a trap. This is also an example from RISE where they were working with manufacturing industry. And this particular manufacturing industry, if you have a, some kind of breakage in the, in the manufacturing line, that would be very expensive. But there are lots of sensors out there, so if we could take that, it's about to happen. We could stop the line and, and like have a, have a cheaper recovery. So in this case, the once once there is a breakage in the manufacturing line, like the, all the sensors go haywire. So, but if you look at the upper graph, you might see that well, there's a slope starting there. If we could detect the early part of the slope before the breakage actually happens. Uh, we can, we can uh, detect it and stop the line. And then they look closer and they see that this is a case of information leaking from the future, which is, uh, which is a trap in, in machine learning environments. Because they didn't actually have the granularity of data for, in order to save space, the measurement uh, units were, will, will discard data if it was similar to the data before. And then to fill in the blanks, they would interpolate between the next change and, and the last change. So this slope was actually an interpolation between the later after the, the process, later values after the process broke and the current normal value. So there was like no signal here. So these are all examples of how your good data can turn bad on the way in. Uh, there's the last one that I like to mention, which is the I mentioned that you collect events and you dump databases. The collecting events is usually uh, gives you more granularity because you can choose to collect everything that happens of relevance in the system. Where if you have your source of truth in the database, you dump them at regular intervals, but you don't get any degree of details in between those intervals. Uh, but nevertheless, it's often pragmatic to, to dump uh, and useful to dump databases. But if you then join your events, with the information that you have the dump in the database, uh, then the time that the event happened is not the same time that when you dump the event. Uh, so you, you always have a certain mismatch here. And that's usually acceptable, but you need to be aware of it. Uh, so for example, we've seen, uh, uh, if, you, if you went to my other presentation uh, yesterday, you, you would have heard about an example where we had customers that were supposed to be free tier customers, but they were using premium services. And that's a case where they had woke up one morning, decided, I'm going to go premium today, bought the premium, but the dump from midnight, they were still regarded as free. So, from data collection to timeliness. And uh, after a while, as you become more and more dependent on these data pipelines, you care about whether they are finished uh, in the morning or not. And this applies to, to batch pipelines. Real time are sort of always there, uh, of course, but they have other significant drawbacks. So usually you want to spend most of your time uh, working with batch pipelines. Um, there are a handful of tools out there, uh, none are super great. The uh, one in the upper left corner is an internal tool from Spotify. Uh, these two are examples from Airflow, whose workflow orchestration includes um, uh, availability monitoring, which is kind of nice. Um, it, that doesn't necessarily mean that you should choose Airflow. It's, Luigi has a smaller scope by design, and I personally prefer that. How do you make things available on time? I'm actually going to leave that out of scope because that's a very large uh, thing to discuss. It's reliability of distributed systems and so forth. And my only general, uh, or my two general ad pieces of advice is like keep things very simple. Avoid distributed systems and clusters if you can, and focus on your workflow orchestration because that's the thing that keeps 
a, that makes a working system out of unreliable components. Moving on to correctness. That uh, is a much <coughs> simpler subject because data processing is inherently very easy to test. All the code is purely functional, it, or it should be purely functional and can be. It's only, uh, the output is only a function of the input and the code. So when you're writing data processing jobs, strive to make them purely functional. Avoid looking things up in, in live databases or live services. Avoid looking at what, what time it is right now and so forth. Those, those aspects should be kept out of the job. That, and that's one of the reasons that we dump the databases all the time. We, we try to never go out to the live databases. And you test them just as you would test any other system, more or less. Uh, you have to choose the this, this, this test scope, the size of the system on the test that you are working with. Uh, and you can choose, for, as, as with any system, you can choose from very small unit tests to, to large whole system uh, tests, including uh, clients, and user clients, and so forth. My advice is to choose few scopes and, and sort of pick those scopes a bit carefully because every scope has a cost. And I, I've seen sort of test scope creep occur that, oh, we couldn't cover this case, so we'll tweak the scope a bit, and then you end up with too many scopes to maintain. Uh, the ones that I recommend are either single jobs, uh, and this, this particular picture uh, illustrates uh, streaming jobs, but it's the same logic for, for batch jobs, or series of jobs, or jobs uh, plus backend services. Those uh, are usually uh, give high return of investment when, when testing. The scopes that I avoid are the ones that include user interfaces and clients, and, and they are uh, because they are expensive to test. And also, in these types of environments, I uh, always avoid unit tests, for the reason that the, the smaller pieces of code are not do not have stable interfaces. The jobs themselves have stable interfaces. They, they are, there are schema definitions, and you don't change the scheme all that often. But inside a job, it's very common to say, oh, I'm going to slice the data another way, and I'm going to try a third way, and so forth. And if you have unit tests there, they actually prevent you from, from doing those changes quickly. Uh, testing a single job, whether it's streaming or not, is, is a simple thing to do. There are a bunch of test tools out there. I tend not to use them because they're often tied to a particular processing uh, technology like Spark or, or Flink or whatever. So, but you can, most of these uh, processing tools you can run in local mode so they can read and write files from your local file system and then you can use JUnit or Scala Test or, or whatever is your favorite thing. And that this is really easy to set up. So, it turns out that when you're, when you're writing your test oracles, um, a, a, the code that checks what uh, a test is supposed to put out, there's some code that is in common for almost every test case. Those are invariants for the records that you spit out. As some things that are true for every record, like uh, if uh, address is null, then the phone number should not be null or, or whatever. <coughs> And there are also invariants across the, the uh, data sets, like all of the users should have a unique ID, for example. And those are valuable to, uh, to express as invariants. And these invariants I tend to use in testing, and I also then use them, the same code, to verify my assumptions out in production. Uh, we will look at production testing later. In the co example code here, um, the, you see something called counters. And that is a way to monitor your assumptions out in production. So you remember the invalid media type. That was something that we bumped a counter for and then uh, exported to, to a database and put it on a graph. So uh, if you would do this, this particular piece of code where you, where you join orders with, with users from your user database, if you would do it naively, you would do an inner join, and implicitly then, all the orders that did not have a matching user would be discarded. Um, so instead, you want to keep track. If you're assuming that every order should have an active user, you want to keep, keep track of the number of, uh, of cases where that assumption does not, is not correct. So instead, you do so use a left join, and whenever this, the, the user value is null, you bump this counter. 
You can also do, which is not in uh, included in this example, you can also at this point do different repairs to your data. And these repairs might very well be uh, really complicated. It, we had some case at one company where we had logged the wrong thing. And for those records where we had logged the wrong thing, we made a really ambitious like joining of different data sets to figure out what we, uh, what we should have logged instead. These types of counter measurements and repairs are really difficult to do if you have chosen SQL as your pro processing language. Right, because then you have to think in each case, uh, is, well, I'm doing a join here, what would I do if, if, uh, if there's a miss? And you have to write like an, a, a sep completely separate statement for that. Uh, whereas if you, do, if you do in Spark, which is the example here, or similar tools, you, have, you typically have an if statement or, or a switch statement as here, where you have the value right here and it's easy to bump the counter. So I tend to avoid SQL for processing pipelines where I care about the quality. And as I said, you, emit, you spit out these counters and you collect them in the database and you hook that up to your standard monitoring and, and alerting system. So Prometheus or, or Stackdriver or whatever is your favorite. And all of the pr uh, standard processing tools like the Spark and the Hadoop ecosystems, they have support for these things. If you want to, if you care about consistency across data sets, then you cannot measure that with counters. So instead you have to have separate jobs that, that take in multiple data sets. It might be multiple data sets, different types of data sets where you want consistency or, or perhaps over time you, want, you might want to check that the difference from yesterday is, not, is only within 10%. You know, if, uh, if you have a 100% difference in the number of orders from yesterday, you probably have a problem and so forth. Uh, and so in this case, you, you, spit, you make a dedicated pipeline that forks off and you, and you spit that information out to your monitoring database and, and into your standard alerting systems. Now, in some cases, you have data sets where you really care uh, that are important for your business. They're used by, by uh, many uh, downstream consumers. I, I, I've been maintaining data sets that were used by, by hundreds of jobs downstream, and if the quality uh, varies on these data sets, you will, have a, uh, you will have unhappy people. But not all of the consumers downstream care have the same uh, care about the quality. In some cases, they just want to do dashboards and get something up there, and they want to, or they want to do recommendations. Whereas, for example, the financial reporting really cares about quality. So you can you can use your your uh, data quality measurements pipelines to spit out something that you send to conditional consumption on downstream w w using your workflow orchestration. Say if the quality of the da upstream data set is, is above a certain level, I will, I will consume it. This has to be done on the consumer side. As a producer, you cannot make that decision for, for the consumers because they have different needs. And in the end, uh, there are things you might goof up anyway and there are things that will go wrong. Uh, so therefore, it is common, if you have a data pipeline that, that produces something like recommendations, it's common to, to keep old data sets with, with recommendation indexes. So if you push out a new one, you, may, you uh, might roll it out carefully to your users, and if you measure that this is, this is bad, something went wrong, you can revert to an old uh, recommendation index without harming the users too much. So, uh, many data different applications are like fuzzy. There's no single right answer. If you have a bookkeeping system, there's a single right answer what, what you should produce. If, you, if you're doing search or recommendations, there's no single best answer. Uh, but our uh, test intensive uh, development methods, uh, our DevOps and CI CD pipelines and so forth, they usually require a binary decision whether this co code change is good or not in order to work well. Uh, so, therefore, you have to translate your fuzzy the, uh, qu code quality measurements to, uh, to a binary decision. 
So there are com a couple of simple strategies. This is actually a, a, a fairly old uh, craft since search uh, products has been out there for a long time. So one is, I'll, I'll mention some of the strategies here. Uh, one of them is to have very simple, obvious inputs that should produce very simple, obvious results, which will detect like if you flip the sign or something like that. Uh, either simple ones or very clear-cut ones. For, for in these examples, you have, yeah, ex uh, you have, uh, we have illustrations of, of clustering algorithms where, where you can, with your eyes, see that this should be obvious. So you encode this in data uh, or in, in your test scenarios and verify that these clusters are formed even when there is a code change. I used to work a long time ago uh, with uh, engineer productivity at Google. Some of my colleagues were testing Google Maps. Uh, and uh, these are some of the tricks that they used at the time. They had a, a golden test suite with some searches that were always supposed to produce the same result. If you search for Stockholm, no matter what other variables, no matter where you are in the world, you should always get Stockholm, Sweden. If you search for Rio, you should get Rio de Janeiro and so, and so forth. Um, and these tests include the real-world data. So this is a test of both the code and the data. For, for the uh, scenarios where, where the, uh, there were not supposed to be clear-cut results, they would have weighted results instead. So they would have a large test suite where there was a desired result and, and, uh, and a, an importance on this particular search. So, so this is some made-up examples where you have a... Uh, you run your test suite, you have a verdict, you multiply with the weights, and you get a sum. So some, whenever you do code change or data change, these uh, results, individual results, might go worse, but the sum should always go in the right direction. And whenever you test with, with real-world data, you need to remember that data is volatile. So if you test both the data change and the code change at the same time, you won't know which one actually changed your result. So test these separately, right? Uh, and if you snapshot real-world data for testing, make sure that does not include personal data or scramble the personal data sufficiently. Otherwise, you will run into GDPR issues because you will forget about that this data exists. So um, completeness of data. The Workflow diagrams or workflow orchestration DAGs, they will help us ensure that we have all the data sets. But those data sets might not include all the data that we need. We might have uh, delayed events and so forth. So, in order to recover from the scenarios where we have delayed events, we typically, there, there are uh, some different strategies. Um, and uh, if you went to my talk yesterday, you heard uh, some of them. If you care about the details, you can re go and uh, rewatch that talk. Uh, this is what, the, what I usually use. I, for the data scenarios where I really care about the quality, we just wait. How long should we wait? We don't know in advance. And, uh, and this example code here is uh, Luigi workflow orchestration, where the bold uh, pieces of code uh, demonstrate how we can say that we need data from the future before we run this particular pipeline. And then, in order to validate our assumptions, in the processing code on the right, we check whenever we have some data that is later than the window, that is too late, we bump a counter. So we know whether our uh, uh, size of window assumption is correct or not. This is also something that, that's kind of difficult to do with, uh, with SQL. And then for the benefit of downstream customers who might be more interested in quick but inaccurate data, we run multiple versions of these jobs with diff different sizes and windows so that we have a fast job and we have, a, we have slow jobs for the financial reporting with, with uh, better completeness of data. So, um, Data quality is one of those things that it might make sense to think of early, in particular if you do machine learning applications, because you wouldn't actually know whether they work or not unless you, unless you care about the quality and measure the quality and so forth. 
Um, so this is something that, that uh, some, some minority in the company usually cares about, say, we should really think about this early. And then we have the other minorities which say, we should really think about all of these things also early. And someone says, we should get the MEP out the door quickly. And this, this doesn't add up, right? So should you care about data quality or not? Um, I gathered some information from, from Irene Gonzalez at Spotify, uh, she, who does a lot of great data quality work there. And uh, the, the only thing she really focused on was, was making people care about these things and how difficult that is. Because it turns out that people are quite happy when they get some graph or get some machine learning model out there. But the, it's often hard to know whether that graph is valuable or not, and whether the model is valuable or not. And people tend to care much less about this last step, even though that's the step that produces business value. This has happened before, right? If we wind back in time, it used, to be the it used to be the case that we didn't really care all that much about code quality either. This is a bug that uh, was discovered in, in Windows 95 and 98. It turned out that if you left the computers on for 50 days, they would crash all the time, consistently. And this was, it took seven years to discover that this was the case, right? And uh, at the time, I remember there was, sysadmins used to brag about they had these Solaris systems that had been running for three, four years, so you'd think, you'd think that you would discover these things. But, but uh, Microsoft and others had pushed the expectations on quality so low that we didn't notice. It used to be the case that we had these developers, and uh, they said, uh, we don't have time to do testing. Uh, we want to rush on with our uh, next functionality, and product owners would say the same. And then they would ship the code over the wall to, for somebody else to put it in production. And um, after a while, we realized that this was not efficient, because the people on the other side of the wall, QA ops and so forth, they, they said that if we, if, we really, if we bothered to do test automation in QA, we would actually globally save time. So eventually we figured out uh, the solution. It's called DevOps. Uh, and uh, they work in with test and quality early. Shifting left is a key to make these things efficient. Now nobody doubts that this is efficient. We even have uh, scientific evidence that, the, that this putting time in code quality pays off, testing time there. Today, we have, uh, we have the uh, group of data scientists instead, and, and they are usually put in a corner somewhere, and they make a model, and then they throw it over the wall to, to data engineers or developers who translate it from Python to Java, and then they throw, may perhaps throw it over the wall to ops if they're still not doing DevOps things. Um, and we have the same kind of dynamics. But I think that now that we've seen the, the DevOps movement, uh, we will get a, a, a the, the data ops and ML ops movement will, will take off because now we know the solutions. I, I hope that sometime in the future uh, we will have a situation that looks more like this. How do you get there? Looking at how tests spread. Um, I was, in, as I said, I was in engineering productivity at Google, and uh, I joined in 2007. In 2006, the, they made something called the Test Certified Program. And this was not enabled by or, or driven by management in any way. It was completely bottom up uh, when, when engineers said, we need to be more mature on this. So this was a ladder that you could follow uh, for, for your project and, and make sure that you sort of progressed in terms of maturity and efficiency. Uh, this worked out great. I got engaged, and I take some credit for, for uh, uh, suggesting and pushing for those things in the green box there. Um, I eventually left Google. Uh, I tried this at the fintech company. It didn't work at all. That was a top-down company. Pointless. Uh, when I got to Spotify, uh, I met with the, with the uh, testing and the agile coach guild and said, I wrote this text for the fintech company. This, I think this might be useful here, but I, I'm tired of testing by now. So, so I'll just leave it on the table here. I left Spotify a few months later. I came back in, in a few years, and people had these t-shirts. <laughs> so it, it, the, the thing ignited and worked really well at Spotify as well, because that's a bottom-up company as well. 
And uh, Spotify is taking it one step further. This is Iran that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and they're now doing test certified for data to, to like raise the maturity level from a bottom up uh, as a, as a bottom-up initiative. Does it work? We don't really know yet. It's too early to say. The jury is still out. So uh, here are some resources. I'll publish the slides later if you, if you don't have time to, to take pictures. There are some tools that I'd like to mention. I haven't had a chance to use uh, any of them. I use the Rata tool things a bit at Spotify, but not too much. Uh, that will help you measure and deal with data quality. Uh, DQ works on uh, Spark data frames. Great expectation is a Python tool. This is a little set of tools to help different to help with testing and diffing data sets and so forth. And you should watch, if you're interested, you should watch Irene's uh, presentation that I mentioned. And I would like to mention one more thing. We, uh, technology has a, a significant impact on society. This means that we, all of these people in this room, have a significant power, much more power than the rest of the world. And the, the, th the decisions that we make daily affect the future. Um, and these are examples of things that I care about. I, I'm, I'm concerned about the environment, I'm concerned about the rise of fascism and the dilution of truth and so forth. You might care about other things, and that's fine. And you might uh, say that, OK, I don't care. I just want to do my tech, and that's also fine. But I want to remind you that whenever we make a decision with a supplier, or uh, in particular the cloud suppliers and so forth, we impact a lot of money moving. So I want you to make a conscious decision whether to put your values and your company values in those decisions or not. Whether they're my values, somebody else's values, whatever values. Just make that a conscious decision so that nobody else uses that power for you. That's what I had to say. Questions? Yes, that's it. Thank you very much.